Good afternoon, everyone. Great to see everyone. I'm just talking to our, our featured guest today, and um, I'm sad to say that uh, he only sold 41 books at the Caldwell College yesterday, Marley, which does not compete with Sarah Palin's sales <laughs> in small towns in Michigan, but nonetheless, uh, is a good start, and uh, we're happy about it. Uh, I'm Ruth Mandel, director here at the Eagleton Institute, and very pleased to welcome you to this latest in, and we have some friends here who've come to early events in this series, in the series on uh, uh, the Rutgers program on the governor. This afternoon, we're proud to host a session recalling one of New Jersey's most beloved, and I say this in the best sense of the word, most beloved politicians, Governor and Chief Justice Richard Hughes. Some of you, including John Weffing, our featured speaker today, have previously participated in some of our programs. For example, um, last year, John moderated a panel at our conference on the relationship of New Jersey governors and the state Supreme Court which was a topic highly relevant to Governor Hughes, who was the only person in our history to serve as governor and also as chief justice. Some of you in the audience also have sat for the video interviews that we've been conducting now for quite some time for our electronic archive, what we call our virtual archive, that we're developing of past New Jersey governors and the state's recent political history. During the uh, period before, I know we've been showing a few clips from interviews and people like Ray Bateman and Joe Katz and Dick Leone and the late Stanley Van Ness as they recall Governor Hughes. So we've got a very <coughs> rich resource that we're developing for the state of New Jersey, and uh, we have many more interviews available on the program website, and for those of you who have not spent part of your leisure time in exploring the website, I recommend it to you because it is a terrific resource that we're very proud of. Today's session results at least <coughs> indirectly, as do all of the sessions uh, for the program on the governor from a generous gift that was made by Governor Brandon Byrne three years ago to the Rutgers Library. It was a collection of papers and memorabilia from his career in New Jersey politics and government to support the cost of processing, cataloging, and preserving those materials. He and Ruthie Byrne decided to raise some funds. And as some of you might expect or know very well, knowing their persuasive powers, they were very <laughs> successful. And uh, we, Eagleton and the Rutgers Library, were able to initiate a much larger project, now known as the Rutgers Program on the Governor. Our ambitious goal is to make Rutgers the leading national academic center for research, study, and discussion of the Office of Governor in the 50 states the Office of the State Executive, starting with and emphasizing our own, New Jersey's Chief Executive. And we've already um, taken some pretty exciting steps, not only in Governor Byrne's archive and a whole series of uh, video interviews with important members of his administration, uh, but also in um, the past year, within the past year, Governor's Kane and Florio and Whitman have also agreed to support similar projects focusing on their own administrations. Ultimately, Rutgers will become the primary national resource for examining how governors run for office, evaluate policy options, and handle their day-to-day -day responsibilities. Some of you have heard me say this before, but I always repeat it in, uh, at our sessions um, for the program on the governor because it's there are always a few more people in the room for whom this is a big surprise, and that is that you would think that this studying the state executives, studying governors, would be um, a familiar subject in universities around the country, and that perhaps there would be some center that does that, and in fact, there is nowhere <coughs> in the entire country where this is a subject of intellectual inquiry or research. And so we are, at the moment, the only show in town or in the country. And um, we've got a lot of work to do to keep that show 
growing and um, and serving uh, serving the purposes of research, education, and public service. Right. Here's a place that we feel very proud to be. I'm now pleased to, you will meet our special guest later, but I'm pleased now to relinquish this podium to um, the person who is responsible for the statute in this program and also central uh, for developing our program on the governor, and that's my colleague, Don Linke. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, before I introduce John Weffing, uh, I just want to say we want to keep this session as informal as we can. We know many of you in the audience, frankly, could be serving on our panel, but we do encourage you uh, after our Q&A and our panel discussion uh, to contribute your own recollections, thoughts, or ideas about the significance that Richard Hughes has had in New Jersey's history. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Morley Wasserman, the director of the Rutgers University Press, who is now going to just uh, talk briefly about the evolution of this uh, long uh, project in coming up with the biography of Richard Hughes. <coughs> right. Good. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is kind of true confession. Um, I need to admit that when John came to me at first with his proposal for a biography, I was less than enthusiastic. You see, I grew up not in New Jersey, but in the 60s in Chicago. Governor Tom, uh, Jim Thompson and Mayor Richard Daley were the names that had meaning for me. Then, by the time I moved to New Jersey in 1978, Hughes had, I think, just about a year left in public office. But I always realized that there are many things I don't know. I have limitations. So before actually sitting down at lunch with John, I decided to run an informal survey at Rutgers University Press. At a staff meeting with 25 people present, I asked how many people had an immediate association with the name Richard J. Hughes. Well, one person raised her hand, and she was our oldest staffer. Uh, but there was an encouraging note. Her memory of Hughes was very positive. Of course, that left 24 staffers for whom the name Hughes, uh, I have to be honest, meant nothing at the time. It was with this background that I began talking to John. Now, anyone who has been in book publishing knows that there is always a disconnect when authors talk about markets. Authors are, of necessity, passionate enthusiasts for their topic. Also, they are typically surrounded by other enthusiasts, or at least like-minded individuals. So the typical author extrapolates from the circle of admirers around him and assumes that there are an infinite number of concentric circles, perhaps even growing larger and larger, of others who are interested in the topic. And here's what's crucial, others who will actually buy the book. <laughs> The typical book editor, having heard this a thousand times and knowing it's never true, discounts all this bravado. And so did I. Well, I need to tell you just how wrong I was. Our sales manager has now named John Weffing our super salesman of the year. <laughs> he has single-handedly reminded the citizens <coughs> of New Jersey of Hugh's importance and has covered the state promoting the book very successfully. We've even had to rush a reprint. Okay. To sell a book effectively, in my judgment, takes three factors. You need an author who can write. And once John weaned himself from the law review article style, <laughs> he became good at this. You need a great and important topic, and I don't need to tell the people in this room that you have that with Hughes. And you need an author who is willing to work with his publisher to publicize the book. It absolutely takes all three, and with this book that we're celebrating today, those have come together in a perfect package. Thank you. Uh, while we respect the uh, discussion today, and John's talk will cover different aspects of uh, Governor Hughes' career and personality and politics, 
we uh, have asked John and the panelists to focus particularly on the personality issues and the personality characteristics of a, of a Richard Hughes. Uh, I've been struck in, while we've been doing these video interviews uh, for the Rutgers program on the governor about the recollections uh, of uh, Richard Hughes and how fondly people remember him and how much they just liked him. Uh, but as a somewhat uh, skeptical fellow myself, I've been thinking, you know, did it really make a difference? Uh, did he ever win something in the legislature that he wouldn't have won because he was a nice guy? Did it really have any difference in his political success that people tended to like him, thought he was a nice person, that he was warm and genial? Uh, did Ray Bateman ever pull his political punches uh, when he uh, could have gone after him because he liked Dick Hughes? And he did like Dick Hughes, and one of the clips that we showed in the video told uh, about uh, their relationship forged over cocktails in the Philadelphia hospital when they were both convalescing uh, every afternoon. But in any event, we've had many stories like that, and I would like to ask people, uh, did that make a difference? And also, does personality today have any uh, impact in the way politicians succeed or fail? We've just gone through a campaign and election cycle where, rightly or wrongly, uh, Governor Corzine's uh, defeat has been attributed to a lack of the types of personal skills that Dick Hughes was famous for. But does that make a difference? And what is the place of personality today uh, in an environment where television and money and partisan politics play so much more important a place than it did uh, during the 1960s and the administration of, of uh, Dick Hughes. So I hope that some uh, uh, thought would be given to the broader questions of personality and politics. Uh, there's the use of them, uh, the misuse of them, and their effectiveness. Uh, John Wepping, I think, in his book has uh, discussed this. The book subtitles The Politics of Civility, uh, which is, I guess, <coughs> the end product of uh, a good personality. Uh, John is a professor of law at the Seton Hall Law School. Uh, he has uh, taught constitutional law. He's taught and written about the New Jersey Supreme Court. Uh, he has also been named by the students at Seton Hall as the, the most uh, popular professor for uh, two years running. Uh, he also has served as associate dean and acting dean at Seton Hall. He has, appointed, has been appointed by governors of New Jersey to state commissions and the various other bodies. In addition to teaching, he's an attorney in private practice, currently of counsel to the firm of orders McPherson, McNeil, and Sparks. Uh, he's a graduate of St. Peter's College, the Law School of Catholic University, and holds a master's degree in law from the New York University. And I won't go through the other uh, books and articles that John has uh, uh, written and published over the years because we really would like to focus on the current book and encourage you to buy it uh, in the lobby if you haven't already. Uh, my uh, so personal association with John goes back many years. In fact, uh, uh, before he was married, uh, his wife, Judge Dory Weffing, sitting over there, and I traveled through Europe together, uh, platonically. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But, uh, but we, we finished our judicial clerkships in the same year and then took off for Europe and uh, had, a, had a nice time driving, uh, driving through Europe. Uh, without any further delay, John Levin. Thank you, Good afternoon, everyone. Very good. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Marley. Uh, it's kind of intimidating today, as was mentioned, uh, many of the people in this room knew Governor Hughes better than I did. All of our panelists clearly did. Uh, Mike Kerber, John Gibbons, other people in the audience certainly knew him far better than I did. And all of them actually played a role in this book because I either stole from articles and things they had written or from my interviews with them to work on this book. So uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with them and uh, a little intimidating, as I say, because they knew him better than I did. But of course, for the last five years, I came to know him extremely well. 
and, we were t and to emphasize the personality to begin with. I, I still remember many, many years ago when I was a young lawyer and getting active in the Bar Association, one event I attended, uh, my mother-in-law happened to be with us and we're walking along and Governor Hughes walks by and says, hi, John. I said, Nana, Nana, did you hear that? He knows my name, he knows my name. <laughs> and what's remarkable is how many times I heard similar stories to that when I interviewed people across the state. They would say, it's amazing. I would meet him, I met him once, and a year later he met me, and he remembered who my parents were, who my kids were. He had an incredible memory for names. And that was a remarkable talent that I think really showed his personality, because he cared about people. Uh, he really did. He was not one of the ones that when you talked to him was looking around to see who else they might be in the room, who might be more important or something like that. He really seemed to direct his attention to you as a person. And I think that personality that he had was uh, a, an instinct almost that he had developed as a child. Uh, Nick Hughes came from a political family. His dad was a politician not nearly as successful as his son was going to be, but an active, involved, devoted Democrat. In the family, it was anathema to be a Republican. Uh, the family was very Democratic-minded. Uh, Governor Hughes' dad was the uh, long-time Dem Democratic leader of Burlington County. Now, probably in those days in Burlington County, Matt met about 30 or 40 people. Uh, but uh, he still had that post for well over 30 years. He met, ran for office many times. It wasn't until he was 72 that he finally won the mayoral position in Burlington City. He held it for two years and lost it the next year. The family story is that some good friends of him said, of his voted against him because they thought at 74 he shouldn't have these burdens of office, and so they voted against him. In fact, uh, it was so late in his career that his son, who was already a judge at that time, swore him in as mayor of Burlington City. In fact, uh, he tried very hard to get, the father tried very hard to get the nomination to run for Congress uh, in their district and he never even got the nomination. It seems I think a Mercer County person was being selected most times. Well, six years later, and you can see the relationship only six years later, Dick Hughes, the governor, ran for Congress. Many of you may know that he did lose an election. Now, he was only 29. He was running in the Democrat and Republican district. He ran as a Roosevelt Democrat right after the court packing plan sort of hurt Roosevelt standard, uh, standing. <coughs> And so he lost fairly big. I have a quote in the book about how one of his lines in the campaign was, the people of my district are now ready for liberal thought. Well, they weren't, apparently. <laughs> so, uh, but that never stopped Dick. Dick learned early uh, the art of being a politician. And he remembered that race. He was only 29, as I say, at that time. But he said he learned how much he actually enjoyed going around, shaking hands, getting to know people. He loved that. In fact, when he didn't get, and I'll talk if I have enough time, about his almost run for the vice presidency, but he always said, you know, I would have loved to run for vice president. Not sure I would have liked to be vice president. And then he would always add, and I never knew where Rwanda was anyway. In the day that his love was local politics, local domestic issues more than foreign affairs. But despite the fact that he didn't have much interest in foreign affairs, he also went off when Lyndon Johnson asked him to, to South Vietnam to monitor the elections. He and a group of other senators and prominent individuals, 20 some of them, monitored the, the elections. Uh, he came back best friends with uh, Senator Muskie, who ended up being the Democratic candidate when Hughes didn't get it later on. Now, I think undoubtedly, in answer to the question Don sort of posed before, that his popularity and his ability to get along with people undoubtedly had a great deal to do with his success in politics. Uh, because when he was selected for both the major positions he held in the state, it was really serendipitous. Uh, nobody expected 
in the in '60 that uh, Governor Hughes would be running for governor the next year. Uh, it was when the uh, person that the Democratic Party had originally <coughs> selected had a heart attack and didn't die and went on fine later on, but he was not ready to run for governor. So they were really looking around for somebody to do it. Well, Governor Hughes was now in practice. He had already spent 10 years on the bench, almost got in the Supreme Court. He had gone up the ranks from uh, his original. It's interesting. He was the last person in the state to be appointed a judge before the shift in, over to the 1947 constitutional system. So he was the last person to become a judge of the Court of Common Pleas, <coughs> one of the old courts that at that time there was something like 16 to 20 different court structures in New Jersey. And one of the main goals of the 47 Constitution was to streamline that system. And the great Arthur Vanderbilt was one of the behind the scenes people working to create the streamlined system of government. So within two days after he was appointed to the court, the 1947 Constitution took effect. He was then joined many other county court judges because we still had a county court system at that time. A few years later, he got an appointment by Driscoll to go up to the Superior Court. At that time, they were very separate courts, not like today where you only have the Superior Court and the <coughs> Chief Justice makes all the assignments within the court system. But he had to be reappointed and uh, by then, Governor Minor made the appointment of uh, him to the Superior Court. And then later he moved up to be the assignment judge in Union County. I spoke at the uh, Union County Bar Association the other night talking about his role as Union County assignment judge. And then up to the appellate division, the great court which my wife now sits on. And uh, so, uh, so he had had a very good career as a judge. He actually tried cases in 21, uh, excuse me, 11 of the 21 counties. Today that would be unheard of, that he would be assigned different places. Vanderbilt actually used him. Vanderbilt, in, Vanderbilt, interestingly, the Republican leader of Essex County, who is now the Chief Justice, he would assign Hughes to very tricky political cases all over the state. Bergen County, uh, Cape May, Sussex County. He served in, in particular assignments in all those counties. Well, at this time he had eight kids, I believe, maybe nine by then. One of his children was actually born after he became governor. And uh, he uh, was thinking that maybe he had to go out and make some money. Judges, even in those days, there's always a concern about judicial salaries. And he was unable <coughs> to maintain his family at that stage. It was also talked that he was being considered for the Supreme Court. Uh, governor Minor called him and said, Dick, you're not on my assignment list for this time, but I'll be considering you for the next open. <coughs> well, at that time, you said, I have to go into private practice, I have to make some money, I have to support this huge family. So he was in private practice for about three and a half years, when all of a sudden he gets a call. Now, he had been involved in politics during that time, too, uh, doing various events, Joel Stern, I did, uh, quote Joel Stern for describing some of his activities during that time. And, uh, but he wasn't act that active at that time. He was really developing his own practice, which was developing very well. I think I have a, a figure of three times the salary he was making as a judge. He got very quickly. And, um, and he was get gets a call. Now, throughout the campaign, one of the great issues was bossism. And, you know, he of course said, I'm not in indebted to anybody. But in fact, there was a meeting of six Democratic bosses at the Norco restaurant, and one of them left the meeting, Will Anders, <coughs> David Will Anders, left the meeting and called Dick Hughes and said, you want to be governor? <laughs> said, um, well, um, no, I can't afford it. Oh, one story I didn't tell you is that when he ran for Congress, he spent $10,000 of his own money, which back in the 40s was a huge amount of money, and he was in debt for a couple of years after that. So he swore after that he'd never spend his own money in a campaign again. And uh, so he was announcing to Will Entz that I'm not going to spend that kind of money. But Will Entz assured him that the, uh, the Democratic Party would raise the money, that he wouldn't have to raise his own money. Later on, of course, he did do quite a bit of raising money, but that's what he was assured of. So you had a meeting of Kenny, um, uh, Kenny, Carey, Kenny, Carey, uh, Rossi, Kenelli, um, forgetting somebody, and Will. 
I don't think he was at that meeting. Was it? Okay. It may have been one or two more at that. And, of course, Thorn Ward. Thorn Ward. We cannot forget Thorn Ward. I mean, does everybody know that Thorn Ward committed suicide uh, while he was Democratic leader of the state in a judge's house? Uh, he was staying there. He apparently was depressed over the collapse of his second marriage. And, uh, uh, and he committed suicide while he was. But for years, Thorn Lord and uh, Dick Hughes were a pair. <coughs> and they were a strange pair. Because <laughs> Thorn Lord, from what I've never met the man, but for everything I read and hear, was a very unusual character. <coughs> he was from the South. He dressed like a, an old professor. So, anyway. Um, and uh, and uh, he. Uh, and they said he never answered questions, he just sort of ran the show to a certain extent. And Hughes was just the opposite, of course. Hughes was the glad hander. Uh, and in fact, I think it was uh, Mr. Katz who said during the <coughs> campaign that we have to call him Gov uh, Judge Hughes in every <coughs> brochure or anything they passed out because. Hughes was such a good guy and a, and a handshaker, people often didn't give him the gravitas that he had. And yet, he was clearly a very extraordinarily bright individual. And yet, he didn't portray that image generally. He portrayed a, a man of the people. And I think that's what drew a lot of people to him, that he appeared to be a man of the people. So these six or seven uh, Democratic leaders meeting at this restaurant, called him, and uh, uh, week later, he eventually said, yes, I will, I will do it. Now, part of it, too, was that nobody expected him to win. Minor had been governor for eight years. It was sort of a tradition that after one political party was in office for eight years, the other political party was going to come in. Uh, and uh, they, there were a number of good Republicans in the primary. And ultimately, Mitchell, who had been in the cabinet for Eisenhower, was selected. So everybody thought he was going to win including President Kennedy. President Kennedy was in Washington just like a couple of weeks ago. It's so how life repeats itself in that New Jersey at that time, as it is today, is one of only two states in the country that have their elections uh, or the year after the president takes office. So there's always a great deal of political and, and national attention on those particular elections. So Kennedy was really worried. He didn't know whether he wanted to go on the line. Now, he did a few things along the way, like issuing statements, what a great governor Hughes would be. But he really was very hesitant to come into the state. And three days before, uh, about a week before, there were some polls that showed that Hughes was getting closer. And Kennedy came in, gave a rousing speech at the War Memorial Building. And maybe that made the difference. Maybe not. Maybe it was the 300,000 hands that you shook. At least that was his own estimate. His son said he would come home with bloody hands sometimes because he shook so many hands. He had a great uh, Jim McLaughlin, who was at that time his partner in practice in Trenton, said that Hughes had the great ability to sleep at a moment's notice. So they'd be riding along in the limousine from one meeting to another. Hughes would sleep for 15 minutes. And Jim would be tired from driving, but Hughes would awake, go in, and be right at the back desk of his form, give a speech, have a talk, back out again, back into the car, back asleep. And that's uh, what gave him some of his great energy that he had. And yet, I always thought, when I met with him, of course he was a little older by then, that he didn't exude that energy. He exuded more of a laid-back thing. But he had this energy that allowed him to go to every place, including, I think it was uh, Mr. Bate, Senator Bateman who uh, told me about him going to Shell Pile, which is a tiny little town down in uh, I'm not even sure. Cumberland. Cumberland, thank you. And so, uh, so amazingly, <coughs> he wins by 30,000 votes. And uh, 34,000. 34,000. <laughs> <laughs> you notice the Republicans have been the exact number. Except the votes from shell files. Right, right. So, so, interestingly, the same thing happened when he became Chief Justice. Uh, he, he was not expected to be the Chief Justice. He's gone back. He's now joined what's now called the Connell Foley firm. They renamed it in honor of use at that time. 
So Hughes became the first name in the firm, and he was doing very well. Many of the people he had gotten to know, like Engelhard and people like that, who had plenty of money, sent cases to him. And he was doing very well in practice uh, at that time. So he wasn't, you know, he wasn't thinking about the chief justiceship, and of course he wouldn't be, because Cahill's now governor. Cahill's a Republican. Well, how could he become a member of the court? And of course, as many of you know, Cahill uh, lost in the primary uh, in his <coughs> attempt at the second run for the governorship. He uh, had appointed Pierre Garvin, his counsel, as chief justice, but Pierre Garvin died a couple of months after his appointment, and it was an open seat, and yet Cahill knew that he was not going to get a Republican into that office with the impending uh, Governor Byrne was about to step into the office, so he knew he really couldn't appoint a Republican. But his old friend, 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 his old friend, Cahill, used to try cases before Hughes when Hughes was a trial attorney, uh, a trial judge, excuse me. So Cahill was a very fine, from what people tell me, a very fine trial attorney. He appeared often before Hughes as a trial judge. They became good friends. Uh, and when Hughes had a, had a technique, uh, and I'm sure many governors used, that when he was urging things from the, <coughs> from the federal government while he was a, uh, while he was a, a governor, uh, he would work very closely with all the members of the congressional delegation from New Jersey. So whether it was a Republican or a Democrat from that congressional district, he would agree to let the congressional the congressperson announced any grants that would come in uh, and he would sort of take a back seat at that moment because he wanted them to get the credit. So again, Cahill was a congressman while Hughes was a governor and so they had developed a further relationship in that capacity. And then there's always, I think, a little bit of camaraderie before, between former governors anyway. And so um, when the, the idea popped into somebody's head. It's, I, I have a footnote dealing with a number of different possibilities who actually first suggested use as the Chief Justice, but Cahill picked up on it and uh, willingly um, chose use to be Chief Justice. So his friendship with Cahill had existed despite the fact that uh, one was a Republican, one was a Democrat, uh, still stood strong and was the important part of it. He had great friendships with Lyndon Johnson. He had a good friendship with both Bob and uh, Jack Kennedy. Uh, he could get along with anybody. I have one line in the book that he's just as happy talking to the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, who were quite active in New Jersey at that time through the Engelhardt family, uh, or the person who was taking him up in the elevator or carrying his bag or whatever. He could talk to anybody like that. Now, I think I am, I'm not sure if I'm running out of time already. You're right. I'm all right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, one of, That's your signal. <laughs> 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 There's got a lot of Right. Uh, I mean, two of my favorite chapters in the book, I think, are the 1964 Democratic Convention here in New Jersey and the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago. Uh, because Hughes played major roles in both of those. Uh, activities. Uh, that was the only time New Jersey <coughs> hosted a, a democratic national convention, uh, any kind of political national convention. Now, unfortunately, from uh, the point of view of the people who thought this would highlight the state as a wonderful place for a convention, at that moment in time, Atlantic City was in pretty bad shape. The, de the news people who arrived had just come from San Francisco where the Republicans had had their convention and they were very dissatisfied with conditions in Atlantic City. So it didn't really um, help Atlantic City particularly. But it did help, I think, cement the close uh, personal relationship between uh, President Lyndon Johnson and Governor Hughes uh, because it, it, in terms of of uh, Johnson at that point, the <coughs> Vietnam War was not uh, dragging him down the way it would a, couple, a year or two later, and he got a lot of great 
uh, support there. The only real issue was who was going to be the vice president. There was a lot of behind the scenes issues earlier on about Bobby Kennedy wanting the vice presidency. And of course, and I'm sure all of you who are politically interested know there was no love lost between uh, Bobby Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and uh, as a result, Lyndon Johnson made sure that Bobby Kennedy couldn't possibly be the vice president. But even to the last minute, it wasn't clear that it was going to be Hubert Humphrey. There was a lot of back, uh, backroom things going on about that. And Hughes was certainly involved in that. He gave apparently a rousing speech at the convention itself, which unfortunately, because some of the things that were going on in the street outside didn't get on national TV, but apparently it was quite a good speech. Uh, and uh, I described in some detail the activities at that convention with the Mississippi delegation, which was being contested at the time. And with the new rules, there were many <coughs> important new rules developed that affected later political conventions, uh, where the Democrats uh, made, started to make rules that were further developed in 68 about how delegations were to be selected and to try and protect the civil rights, particularly of African-American citizens. So uh, I think that's a very interesting scene, uh, stories about the Duke and Duchess of Windsor arriving and nobody knowing who they were and things like that. Uh, so there, there's some uh, interesting moments in that. And the 68 was even more exciting, I think. Uh, Hughes was the chair of the Credentials Committee. There were over a thousand challenges to the seating of delegates during that time. I think something like 16 states had battles going on, primarily civil rights issues, African-American <coughs> delegates against white delegates from the same states and things of that nature. And, uh, and uh, uh, he willingly took on that incredibly difficult job. Uh, there's one quote that I've always liked from Theodore White. Many of you know Theodore White as the chronicler of the election. Uh, of the elections, 1964, 67, uh, 68, and 72, and so on. Um, no, I feel. As chair of the Credentials Committee, Hughes' decisions were bound to offend some groups. One decision, which was meant to be fair to both competing groups, ended up displeasing both sides. Two Georgia delegations were competing for <coughs> seating, and the Credentials Committee gave seats to both and split the votes evenly between them. The decision pleased no one. It was, of course, vintage views, trying to create a compromise which would satisfy both sides, even though in this case it did not work. The convention conferred, concurred with Hughes and voted to divide the delegates between the competing groups. Hughes' chairmanship of the Credentials Committee made his vice presidential nomination virtually impossible because some groups would be offended by whatever decisions the committee made. Angelo Baglivo, a reporter for the New York Evening News, was covering news of the convention. When asked why Hughes accepted the chair, Baglivo said he knew it would doom his chances, but he did it out of loyalty to the president and the Democratic Party. Hughes' work as chairman was widely praised. In the making of the president, 1968, Theodore White, after recognizing that the Credentials Committee's del deliberation could have degenerated into a succession of laws, said, quote, Fortunately, the party's national committee had chosen as its chairman Governor Richard Hughes of New Jersey, and they could not have made it, they could have made no better choice. Hughes, a man of the old politics, a stern commitment man on the war, was a judge by profession and instinct, a man of absolute fairness whose honor insisted on review of facts. Uh, and so on. So, uh, so Again, that did, in fact, doom his chances to run for vice president. Uh, uh, Governor Conley, who many of you remember, was in the uh, car with uh, Kennedy when he was shot, uh, led a delegation to Hubert Humphrey saying that we don't want you. There has to be some uh, give back to the southern delegations for the decisions that the committee made. We don't want you. At that point, of course, Muskie ended up being elected. But not before um, Hubert Humphrey talked to Hughes, uh, explained to him uh, the situation, and asked him what he thought of Muskie. As I told you, I think before Muskie and he had shared a plane 
uh, going out to South Vietnam and have been very, become very close friends. I speculate in the book whether or not there's any chance that if Hughes had been selected, he would have been, uh, that it would make any difference. I came to the conclusion it would not have uh, for a number of reasons. First, because although there was a fairly close vote uh, between Nixon and uh, Humphrey in the um, general election, in the general count, uh, there was a big, a fairly significant difference in the um, electoral college. And even if we, they had taken New Jersey, which they lost to Nixon, uh, that would not have been nearly sufficient. And Muskie himself was a, quite a good uh, candidate. And uh, also, it's questionable how he uses wonderful interpersonal skills <coughs> really translated into having to talk to thousands of time. And his, those skills that made him such a great a politician on the local level would have actually translated into that kind of campaign. Plus, some of his own Democratic colleagues were not so happy about the idea because, as all of you know, under the system uh, in New Jersey, if the governor leaves the position of the governorship, it goes to the president of the Senate, who happened to be a Republican at that time. And so there was some uh, issue there even within the Democratic group. But you seem to have the ability uh, of having uh, a discussion with somebody, arguing with them over politics, and then joining them for martinis later on. It was a great talent that I think he had. And now I think I've gone up far long enough <coughs> and turn it over. Uh, I'm going to give a very shortcut uh, introduction to the panelists. So uh, many of you know them very well. Uh, Dick Leone is currently the president of the Century Foundation. Uh, he served uh, as a, an assistant to Governor Hughes and uh, also a state treasurer during the Byrne administration. Also had a successful career on Wall Street. Uh, and uh, he also uh, most recently uh, was the uh, chairman of uh, Governor Corzine's uh, transition after he was elected governor and has served, I think, as a close uh, informal behind-the-scenes advisor to the governor since. So he spans quite a bit of history and uh, can, I think, talk a little bit about the comparisons in terms of the times that we're talking about tonight. Joel Stearns uh, is the uh, founding uh, a partner of Stearns & Weinroth, uh, Trenton uh, Law Firm. He's one of the most uh, prominent lawyers uh, in the state of New Jersey, uh, known uh, recently particularly for his uh, representing casino clients, uh, also getting uh, invited to the weddings of the Trump family. Uh, uh, Joel served as, as, uh, as acting uh, commissioner of the Department of Community Affairs uh, in the U.S. administration, and then at the end uh, moved on to become counsel to the governor. Uh, Raymond Bateman is former Senate president. Uh, and uh, 1977, a Republican uh, gubernatorial candidate. He heads his own uh, government relations firm uh, in Somerville uh, today. And uh, I think most of you know Ray's many activities and has worked for higher education at Rutgers and locally in Somerset County. Uh, Joe Katz uh, started his career as a uh, political reporter after getting his master's degree in journalism from Northwestern. And Prior to that, his bachelor's at Rutgers. Uh, Joel uh, joined as a, a special assistant, or whatever they called an assistant in those days, to the governor. <coughs> Was, as I think we've heard already, a key political and communications uh, strategist uh, for the governor. Uh, later, he uh, founded a very successful lobbying firm in Trenton. Was one of those pioneering lobbyists, a uh, dirty word nowadays, but in those days it wasn't so dirty, uh, and is now largely retired. Uh, Michael Murphy, the governor's stepson, uh, was supposed to join our panel. Uh, he, his office called about an hour ago. He was flying in from Florida. Uh, he was supposed to get in at 12.30, but apparently weather either here or there has uh, delayed his flight. And he, found, and he was flying on Spirit Airlines, uh, the cheap airline that uh, 
flies out of Atlantic City to, I think, Orlando. Yeah. So I guess... Uh, the system was down there. Yeah. The whole system was down there. Oh, so, so that's a better issue. <laughs> 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 but, uh, but I, I sort of figured that the Mike the Fly spirit because uh, the, of the teachings uh, he received from his mother and father to save money. Uh, because they only have, I think, two flights a day from Atlantic City, so when one gets canceled, you're in big trouble. But I'd like to take the prerogative of, as the moderator to sort of put the question that I raised before uh, about personality. Uh, I'll allow the panelists to talk more freely about what they'd like to talk about, but I'd like to start maybe with uh, Dick Leon, since you've had contacts both uh, with Governor Hughes and Governor Corzine, uh, discuss a little bit about the differences uh, of personality and, and again, uh, did it make a difference? Dick? Well, I would, I, I've known more governors in New Jersey than the next governors than I ever intended to know. <laughs> <laughs> and would be governors. It was actually because of my, through Governor Hughes originally, that I met Tom Kane, who subsequently pointed me to the Port Authority or the attorney. So I, he was, had a big effect on my life. Um, he was the best boss I ever had, and he spoiled me. He left me with the illusion that there would be people like him in politics all the time <laughs> who were smart and could be persuaded by argument regardless of the balance of forces who were funny. He, the accused could take the best lines you wrote and make them better. Um, I didn't know this line hadn't been invented yet, but I remember Brendan Byrne saying to me, sometimes I get the feeling you're always measuring me against Dick Hughes. And I could have said to him, as I could have said to all seven or eight of the governors, I know I knew Governor Hughes and you're no governor. <laughs> <laughs> he was, it was a special uh, treat, and it did make the influence of personality on politics is hard to measure. The impact of individuals on history. Is hard. There's a terrific book, by the way, I'm sure out of print, but probably in the Rutgers Library by Tom Wicker about LBJ and JFK, and which is about the influence of personality on politics. Hughes, I guess I want to vary a little bit from the main storyline without in any way changing the, the validity of the main storyline. He was a wonderful, warm and open and uh, winning man uh, across party lines and across all lines. But he was also very tough and had no illusions. One of the first things he said to me when I went to work for him as a kid, really, was, you know, you've got to understand a couple of things about politics in New Jersey. There's no gratitude, there's no loyalty, and John <laughs> Kenny's a son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Because of a man named Eugene Genevieve, which is the other Rutgers connection, I got to play a bigger role in the campaign than anybody expected. That was Joe Katz's fault. And so I used to travel around with the governor. I was warned, don't expect to talk to him, he'll be asleep. But he was awake. So. And I'll never forget one of the first nights we were out, we were at a restaurant, and he was praising the food they brought to cook out, and everybody was carrying on, and they gave him some food to take with him. And we left the lavish praise by everybody. He sat down in the car and took a look at me and said, get rid of this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so he was a politician. <laughs> he was, a, he was a, a special guy, and I think managed to make the state a modern state in part because of his personality. He, in a sense, he got both the broad-based taxes, the sales tax and the second choice as governor, which was very, very hard and the income tax when he closed the schools as chief justice. Uh, he also took on the education establishment, which was considered unbeatable, and really remade higher education in the state. Uh, changed the six normal schools into the state colleges we have today, the community colleges. I don't think that would have been possible for a man who didn't have his charm and warm <coughs> ability to convince people or to have people come to the conclusion that he was doing things out of conviction and honestly and openly. I think otherwise a governor would have walked into a buzzsaw in that education. Not to compare him to the most recent governors, uh, 
it's tough because the environment has changed as, as bad as the Newark News used to be and, and some of the papers used to be you've got a kind of fair shake from the press you don't get that anymore I think Hughes would have been terrific had there been more televisions frankly you don't really talk to thousands of people when you're on television or you're campaigning you're in one living room at a time and he was really good at that and I think yeah, he would have been really good at television now remember this was a primitive era in the politics there was no television in the primaries there was no television in Brendan Burns first primary it's only in the general election so it's hard for us to put ourselves back into that era I think in some ways, Hughes was betrayed by his friends and some of the things that later became a problem. Uh, but he personally um, might have been too trusting, but I think he would have believed that erring on that side was the right side. And remember, you think of all the slogans. The slogan in Hughes' re-election campaign was, he cares. And that had a, that's not a very powerful slogan by today's standards. And yet it was effective because people believed that he did care about people like them, particularly those questions that's in, in Bowen. Uh, we've gone from an era when, in Hughes' time, about two-thirds of the public thought government would generally do the right thing to where about 25% of the people, maybe even less than that today, think government will generally do the right thing. So that's an environment in which I don't know if, if Dick Hughes' special gifts would have worked because the degree of cynicism and negativism is so great that it might have just overwhelmed the fact about the kind of human being he was. Well, that's a long-winded answer. But I think he was one of a kind. <clears throat> uh, we've had some good governors, I would say, better than we deserve. Uh, and, uh, but I think in him we had uh, a very special person to be around with great experience. And uh, the only real criticism I'd make is that it made me stay in politics longer than any sane person. <laughs> Joel? Well, I won't comment on the same subject because uh, he has done his usual great job in that regard. I will say that you uh, talked uh, about uh, the, de the decline of New Jersey governors. We had to say. And I won't say when it started, because uh, too many people from too many other places. <laughs> we used to say in New Jersey politics, the theory of evolution is no longer working. This can be an intelligent design. <laughs> uh, as I say, I think I'd be better off commenting that John's book is so comprehensive, I think. There are very few things that were left out of it, but it certainly, I think, I could use a little embellishing in some places. And I would start, first of all, with that uh, moment in 1968 in which he quoted uh, uh, White, but there was a further thing that he quoted, which was uh, a really more of an indication of who Dick Hughes was in politics. As I think um, somebody told you, and Joe certainly knows, uh, Richard, at, on the Wednesday before the, uh, the, the, on the Wednesday of the evening that the vice president was to be selected, the day before Johnson came to town, uh, Connolly called from the office, of the, from the lobby of the hotel in which the users were staying. And Connolly said, Nellie and I would like to come up and visit you for a few minutes. And he came up, had a private visit with him, and left. And after he left, Betty, you said, now what do you think that was all about? Do you think he just came up to say hello? And Dick, you said, no, Betty, he came up to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you want to tell you one thing, thing about Dick, I think that was the one thing about Dick, and I do think it was in the book. I keep pointing. It is in a book. <laughs> but it was a great time. I was there at the beginning and had the pleasure of, the yeah, pleasure isn't even the word, the honor of practicing law well within for the last 10 years of his career. And uh, the being at this council for the couple of years I was was great. I was happy before I go further to see my successor sitting there looking so young at the time. And uh, 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 it was a great time and a great transition. Um, the the uh, things that I really want to talk about, when you asked that personality, 
is a man who existed in the political life that I keep looking at. I'm going to find John and look at him. The uh, political, uh, uh, existed in political life with literally no yeah. ego. And if you were, want to talk about one of a kind, here was the guy who could place himself in perspective and who could talk to people and be lectured by people, Democrats and Republicans alike and say, the hell with it, I've got my goals, and I'm going to get to those goals, and we're going to work towards them. And that is the way he conducted his life from the day that uh, uh, I met him uh, until the day that he died. And in doing that, uh, he, he was willing to take anything from anybody. He used to say, not necessarily, but I think to them, and I'm going to leave, Joe's got a better memory than I have, so you'll confident. He used to say, there was what you described, what you described as the people who selected Dick Hughes. Now, Larry Builder, who was as close to him as everybody used to say, that that was the third house of the legislature. The, and and uh, th those people would do whatever, they'd ask for things, and Dick Hughes would always be saying at the end of it, uh, all right, you got the, deep, the meal. Can I get a few crumbs from the table? <laughs> and he would just let them talk like that and react like that. And, and uh, you know, I couldn't see uh, a lot of the colleagues that we've had over the years reacting that way. They never did. And uh, that was his style, and that was the way he handled things. And he was never, uh, a, a, never a, a moment in his life that he didn't respect the judgment of the person he was talking to at that time. And that's why he was really successful as a governor and as a judge in the rest of his life. And there is no better example, and I got to know him well that way, than the guy to my left. Senator Bateman, I believe, was Richard Hughes' closest friend. I hope that doesn't make anybody sorry here, and I hope it doesn't upset the Republican Party. But, I, <laughs> but it was, okay, I guess it won't do that. But there was no question that it would, not only is a question of the friendship that they that threw out of the book, but the friendship <coughs> they threw out of trying to do something positive for New Jersey. You know, one of the things in the book that is, uh, uh, that if you've read it, you, or you will read it, have the pleasure of reading it, was what Richard Hughes' father used to say to him. And he, he gave him all kinds of things to live by. And one of the things in the book was, you always pick and vote for the right man. Yes, you're a Democrat, and you'll always be a Democrat. But if you see a better person, you vote for that better person. And Dick Hughes used to say, I remembered my father's advice, but thank goodness in 40 years of voting, I never had to use it. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's beyond that period. You have to freeze everything for 10 years. If that message from his father who came into play it was when this guy was running for governor because they really truly loved each other. I can't tell you what Dickies did. I wouldn't know if I if, if I wouldn't tell you if I did. But I know how much he loved uh, Ray Bateman and that's part of the that's part of the Dick Hughes personality. He worked with everybody. He got through to things. And it got through things. And, uh, and the last I'm gonna say this you know I've got about a hundred different notes like this I really love. But the personality, that's the kind of business that was for the day he died. I can tell you many, many stories that he had Betty, but I think that's enough. There was no one like him that in all of real. Let me turn to, to Ray Bateman and uh, press Ray. Uh, did your great friendship with uh, Dick Hughes change anything you ever did as a politician? Yeah, he. Uh, uh, he changed it all the time. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't read uh, John's book. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, but it's a true confession night. I, uh, uh, I said a lot of things when John interviewed me, and I'll, uh, if I contradict any of those, or <laughs> strictly memory. Uh, it's it's hard to know where to start. Uh, Dick Hughes. Uh, uh, <coughs> Dick Hughes had every kind of legislature to work with. Uh, he started out with the Democrat Assembly and, and Republican Senate, and then for two years, his last two years of his first term, uh, the Republicans had both houses. And then, uh, thanks to Wayne Dumont, uh, uh, the, in his second term, uh, the Democrats, for the first time in history, I guess in modern history, had both houses of the legislature. 
and then uh, because they because the governor and others made long time commitments to, to organize labor to uh, uh, to give unemployment <coughs> compensation to strikers, uh, A400 uh, became infamous and uh, he went from a two to one Democratic legislature to a three to one Republican legislature. And I, 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 I point all that out because through all that, uh, uh, his ability to, uh, to get along with the other side was really the most important thing uh, uh, in, his, in his political makeup. I mean, he could, he could, he could change directions too quickly. Uh, we talked about the income tax. And I'll never forget that fight uh, in '66. Uh, uh, he had, yeah, he had nothing but uh, negative things to say about the regressiveness of a sales tax. <coughs> uh, terrible for the public, and he fought like hell for for his income tax, which. Uh, which was soundly defeated on the floor. Fifteen minutes later, he had me in his office, and he said, "Now let's put together the sales tax." <laughs> <laughs> I, I never forget that because uh, that was a real lesson. He he had the ability to uh, uh, turn uh, uh, defeat into victory, uh, and he's probably the only governor that got that that, that had a broad-based tax. Sponsored by both parties. Now, did anybody know any other? Uh, it was uh, his speaker, John Davis, and his, uh, his majority leader, Bob Halpin, and me. Uh, we were the sponsors. And Dave Goldberg and I spent two days in, uh, in the Princeton Inn getting all the sales taxes from around the country and made what we thought was the most progressive one. But that was, that was, that was vintage Dick Hughes. You know, he lost the battle. And then he won the battle uh, uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, I'll never forget that uh, <laughs> when we took up, when we had a three to one uh, uh, Republican legislature uh, in his last two years, uh, he wanted to do a lot of things. So he came after us with a $2 billion <laughs> bond issue proposal, which was incredible you know, in New Jersey at that moment. <coughs> it was, uh, uh, so we, we had. We got, I got all of the legislators together, the Republicans, and for two days we hashed that one out, and we got it down to 900 and some billion dollars, and you would have thought we had a great victory. <laughs> <laughs> he had the victory, he got what he wanted. Uh, he just gave us, gave us a much bigger <coughs> figure. But that, that's, uh, uh, you know, we, we became very close friends, and, and he was, he was literally my best friend in politics. Uh, and I, I think my own. I, I've known every governor since Al Driscoll, and worked around them. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he, he was just special. Uh, and I don't know whether it's in the book or not, uh, but uh, uh, we really got close. He, Betty, and I, when I was in the University of Pennsylvania Hospital in Radnor, downstairs where the poor people uh, uh, are taken care of for six and a half weeks with a for the heart and blood problem. He comes in uh, about halfway through my stay and uh, to get his uh, cataracts operated on. And after two days after the operation, who shows up? Uh, he's up on Radfin 7. That's where all the rich people go. <laughs> or the important people. Uh, he shows up, or Betty shows up with a wheelchair and says, come on, we're going upstairs. And so she wheels me upstairs and she's got this gorgeous, gorgeous silver pitcher filled with martinis. <laughs> and for the, next, for the next five days, <laughs> four o'clock every afternoon, <laughs> we got sloshed together. And, uh, uh, you know, there wasn't anything that he, he spoke at my testimonial, I spoke at his testimonial. Uh, I put him on a trust. He put me on the Prudential Board. I mean, we were damn good friends. I mean, we were very close. He was my kind of person because, uh, unlike in today's political world, he recognized that most things have to get done with two parties. And you can't, you can't govern for very long 
in one political party and, and get the kind of uh, compromise uh, and input that uh, that he got. And so he he uh, he used to meet with us every uh, uh, in, in the staff. I'll tell you, we met before every legislative session, and uh, uh, he had his agenda with the leaders. Uh, he'd have his agenda, we'd have our agenda, uh, and we'd fight about it, but he got to know our limits and we got to know his limits. And if there's anything missing in the public world today, it's the ability to, for two parties to, to knock it out and get, to, get, get together on solutions. He was classic at that. He was just, <coughs> he was just uh, uh, impressively good at, at finding uh, five partisan and solutions, uh, and I would, I would have uh, uh, renamed the book something about bipartisanship because he, he, he wrote he wrote the book. I mean, he was, uh, 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 and, and it wasn't it, it wasn't all friendly. I, 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 when I was majority leader of the assembly, Bill Osbert, my senator, was president of the Senate, and we'd go in there and we'd get in the car to go to Trenton, and he'd say, "Well." What the hell are we going to beat Dick Hughes up on this morning? You know? <laughs> and we would go in and deliberately fight about something, but we we got together on things that were important. Uh, and uh, his his friendship was uh, was about as meaningful as any I ever had in public life. And uh, uh, he was just. Uh, he was just the right governor at the right time when New Jersey was expanding <coughs> uh, when everybody, all the war children were, were getting into higher education. And uh, he just made a, a lot of, a lot of uh, good partisan and bipartisan decisions. So I'm happy to be here. Ray, uh, did he ever come to you and say, uh, Ray, you're a friend and I need your vote on this? So did that ever sway you in what oh, you yeah, did on the floor? We did that often, and and, and, the, and the reverse was true. Uh, no, it's a it, you, when you when you have a, a close friendship, even though you're you know, we, we used to fight about a lot of things. But when you have a close <coughs> friendship, it makes it makes a difference. And that, you don't see that in public life today. And, you know, you don't. Uh, everybody fights everybody, and, uh, and they mean it. <laughs> Joe Katz? I want to take off from where uh, 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 Ray left off. Uh, talk about uh, bipartisanship. Ray was an obvious friend of Dick Hughes. Uh, he stood up for his party and its principles. But the most obvious protagonist of Dick Hughes in the state was a guy named Charlie Sandman, uh, who later defeated Bill Cahill in the primary election. Very partisan. Uh, but I don't think too many people know about this. So, uh, one night, uh, Dick and Betty Hughes had a big reception for the Senate at Morven, and uh, uh, it was bad weather, and Charlie came from Cape May, which is pretty much as far away from Trenton as you could get in the state. And uh, Dick asked him and his wife to stay over. And uh, as a result of that, the uh, child that was conceived that night was re named Richard J. Sandman. Who <laughs> 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 so became a lawyer and later married a lovely young girl who was uh, assistant counsel to Governor Tom Kane. <laughs> And uh, I said, I know about your husband's birth. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that didn't stop Charlie, uh, Sam, and Dick Hughes from going at, at each other. Uh, I uh, wanted to touch on a different angle of it. Uh, Ray talked about uh, Hughes having had uh, this, uh, every type of legislature. But he, there's all, there are also two parts to the Hughes gubernatorial career. And the first one was prologue. He laid the groundwork for the great achievements of his second term, primarily the first two years, when he had a Democratic legislature. And uh, when he took office, the big issue, which was made to, into the issue by uh, the leading paper in the state, the one I happened to work for in New York, was no new taxes. And uh, 
every gubernatorial candidate of every party, as far back as I could remember, had to pledge uh, his life that he would never promote a sales for income tax. Hughes was the first governor to, to break that pledge. But he said, I won't ask for a broad-based tax unless there's no, no other resort. And uh, so we came into this uh, tinny little government with no money, no broad-based tax. And Hughes had big plans. So how can he, uh, how can he show the public that he, uh, uh, he's going to try every alternative? So he and uh, John Curry, who was the state treasurer, and Avery Mule and the state budget director, cooked up a plan where they were going to mortgage the turnpike, <laughs> which, was, which was making a lot of money. They had a surplus. They were going to borrow $750 million. I think the state budget was only about $100 million in those days. And, uh, and paid off with turnpikes, turnpike surpluses. And you wouldn't need a broad-based tax. So we cooked up, a, uh, we got the, uh, uh, we cooked up, a, it had to be done by referendum because in those days, people read the constitutional provision against the borrowing. <laughs> <laughs> means something. Uh, and not only did we have a referendum, we had two referendums. It was broken up to 400 million and 350 million. And uh, uh, we so uh, wanted to get the evening news and, and into the afternoon papers, which were then influential, what a change that's been, that we didn't announce it until uh, six, we had a press conference at about 6.30 in the morning. And uh, uh, so he announced this, this plan, and it looked infallible at first. And, uh, uh, in fact, we were laughing about, boy, Bill Ashton and Ray Bateman must be driving down from Somerville. They probably drove off the road. <laughs> <laughs> but as uh, fate would have it, people found a flaw here and a flaw there. And even though we had a bipartisan committee headed by probably the most conservative industrialist in the East, not only in New Jersey, General Robert Wood Johnson, <coughs> Uh, we failed with the thing. And we lost both houses of the legislature. We got the assembly. So he took quite a beating. The Newark News suggested that he resign. He didn't to do so. But it set the stage. It set the stage for the people coming to realize that New Jersey had some uh, real, real problems of paying for things. And it also set the stage because he was campaigning all over, as hard as he had for himself two years earlier. This was in 63. And, uh, and then in 65, when uh, Dick alluded to it, uh, when a guy came to me, uh, Paul Perecca, Judge Perecca there, he's a mutual friend, a guy named Bernie Pop that came up from Cumberland County. He was an advertising guy. He had this plan for a campaign based on Billboards saying, because he cares, because Judge Hughes cares, New Jersey built so many miles of roads or did this. We didn't have that many accomplishments, to tell you the truth. <laughs> 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 so we decided to drop the roads and all that stuff and just use because he cares and show his, show, show his picture and say, re elect Judge Hughes, uh, Governor Hughes by then. And it worked and because he had, he had, uh, found a receptive audience in the people of New Jersey. And then he went on to the second term, and I left the governor's office, and that's when these guys lost both houses of the <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to sort of throw it open to the audience you now, uh, either for questions for John or the panelists, or to contribute your own thoughts. Uh, anyone like to start? Yeah? Uh, well, I was, only, I was only in high school and uh, college during the second term where Hughes really made his mark. Uh, Jeff, Jeff, why don't you talk? So, uh, I'm sorry. Was talking. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Uh, but it, it, those two legislatures, two very distinctive legislatures, 
where he accomplished an extraordinary agenda, including in the second one, where you would have thought that after the 67 debacle for his party, that it would have been almost impossible. In the first, the legislature that famously had the courage to do what was right and was then rewarded for it uh, by being tossed out, uh, mm -hmm. You had the intermediation of the county chairs in the big counties who were really the folks who would deliver votes and the governor presumably didn't have to deal with the individual legislators as much. But in that second uh, Republican controlled legislature, I wonder if Frank can explain to us uh, what the dynamics were inside the party caucuses. But you had three to one majorities, you didn't even need Democrats for an emergency resolution. Uh, who talked to whom? Was it simply through the leaders of the, in the legislature? Were there other ways to which the governor got to members, the rank and file? And what kind of, of hard right versus moderate splits did you have that the governor was able to work around in order to build coalitions for things like Meadowlands, uh, the school aid, uh, and such that were astonishing achievements given the, what seemed to be a hopeless political prospect? Anyone? Ray? 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 <laughs> he, he dealt uh, uh, not exclusively with legislative leaders. He had, his, he, he had, uh, he had others, uh, but uh, he, he did spend a lot of time with us. And uh, uh, he was, I'm trying to think what, what year it was. Uh, when, uh, and this is the way he worked, uh, when uh, uh, Seton Hall asked to ask the state to uh, buy their medical, their Jersey City Medical Center, and uh, here's, here's Dick Hughes, a Roman Catholic, who uh, knew just as we knew that, uh, the, that the Catholics had defeated a, in the 50s a, a, a referendum question <coughs> for for a med medical school program. And, and typical Dick Hughes, he, he set up a group which was mostly Republican uh, to, uh, to try to solve the problem. And uh, actually, I don't know whether that's in the book either, but uh, the problem was solved by Mason Gross. Uh, Mason Gross, because uh, Hughes really had a dilemma. And Mason Gross uh, came to, he called me, and we went over to Mormon one one Wednesday night. I'll never forget it. Uh, and he made a proposal that uh, Dick Hughes jumped all over, which was, uh, why don't you uh, why don't you get two medical schools? Start one at Rutgers at the same time you're buying Sutton <laughs> Hall, which was a which was a classically good solution to him. And, and it's just a, an undoable problem. But but uh, in the course of it, he had guys like Al Beadleson, for example. Involved, he got involved. That wasn't in the leadership, then. but uh, uh, he was just good at uh, uh, spreading the spreading the, the turmoil or spreading the wealth or getting everybody involved uh, or the people important in the legislative process involved. Yes, uh, I've lived in New Jersey most of my life, and uh, I've been very impressed with Governor Hughes and his presentation and the panel respond. I just have two questions related to clean government. And uh, this may have changed, but I remember years ago in New Jersey, a politician could run for more than one office. He could hold an office in a municipality on the state level. I don't know if that still exists. Okay. <laughs> and the second part, correct me if I'm wrong, are there term limits in New Jersey to the state legislature? And I think one of the reason no. we may not have clean government in many states, I'm speaking generically now, is the inability uh, to have term limits. And I think term limits <coughs> prevents uh, this type of uh, situation. We tried and lost on term limits. I, I, couldn't, <coughs> I, I disagree. Both counts. <laughs> We're not, you know, we don't walk into the bathroom the morning of election day and right on the mirror stop me before I vote for the same guy again. <laughs> this, we have this system called democracy in which people get to choose their leaders, throw them out, keep them, do whatever they want. And I think they should be allowed to do that. It isn't, it isn't, the, what you do is weaken people in politics if they serve short terms. We've seen that around the country where they have term limits 
and you strengthen some other parts of the system, you probably, the organizations are disproportionately strong in New Jersey anyway, and they would be even stronger if there were now long-serving legislators. And so I, I think, you know, our problems come from a deeply rooted culture, politics and society, and the lack of fresh air, the lack of scrutiny, a shallow press, and no television. But the, that's true of most of the states in the Northeast. You get out the rest of the country, it's not quite like that. I mean, it's true that you could probably assemble a quorum of former political leaders at a minimum security prison and have a have a meeting that would be substantially more substantive than those you could find who are at liberty in the state and still on the diet called conspirators. I have no illusions about how bad this has turned out to be, but I think term limits would probably make it worse. And I think the answer ultimately is we get these waves of reform. Hughes wanted uh, to be able to provide immunity to uh, people who were willing to turn state's evidence essentially and that was a major breakthrough and there was a wave of reform and there have been times when people have been aggressive to going after that. <coughs> the way the business is done for so many people, I think, is that they get into politics for their own reasons. And the only thing that will ever change that is, a, is an aroused public. Uh, and, uh, We've got actually some of the, you know, Alvin Rosenthal can comment on this, we've got some of the strongest rules and laws in the country, but you can't ultimately protect yourself against crooks if they're <coughs> determined to be crooked. You can just catch them and punish them. I think Professor Russell did The first one. question was I've got, I've got a question, but it's not, it's not on the corruption of New Jersey politicians. It's really, it's on Dick Hughes. Um, I remember, and, and this is something I remember and repeat all the time when I think about political leadership, but Dave Goldberg told me when we were driving somewhere, and I don't know how the conversation started, about a, a quality that Dick Hughes had, and I wanted to just see if you would confirm it or deny it, because I've been repeating it and I like to repeat it, but you can deny it if it's not true. <laughs> And Dave Goldberg said that what his really great talent was, was that when he looked at people, he saw what was good in each individual. He didn't look and see what was bad. He saw what was good. He played to the good, and therefore he encouraged and brought out more good. And that, I guess, would go with getting them to participate and, uh, you know, just... He, he, he had that view of the world. Now, is that just too roseate? Is it a more cynical application in order? No, I, I think that's amazingly true. But that's not to say it was always in uniform. But you never saw oh, no. the, the, you never saw anything but the human side by finding that. I'm sorry that everything reminds me of the story, but that one reminds me of the story with Mike Herbert, who was the secretary and who was my beloved partner for until he got wise and moved to Princeton, but anyway. Uh, Mike was representing somebody in some county, in some municipality. He's in Park. You, you can tell the rest of the story, but the fact of that, <laughs> that he, was our, he was our client, He was, a, and it was a Democratic primary, and somehow Dick Hughes got to, or God bless him, remember he's now retired, it's 10 years past even being Chief Justice, and endorsed his opponent. <laughs> <laughs> so he could see good in everybody, <laughs> including our law. Can I give the sequence, sequence to that? That's when uh, Joel and I were partners, and, and uh, the Seaside Park was a Republican mayor, Republican town. Somehow we got in down there. I don't know why, but we've been representing him for a number of years. Very fine mayor, Republican. He's now in the Superior Court, uh, John Peterson. He calls me up and says, I'm very disappointed in your firm. And then he explained why. Some guy who owned the bar was a Democratic candidate. That's true to life, I suppose. <laughs> and he, uh, he was running against Mayor Peterson. And I went to Governor Hughes and I said, Governor, you know, this is a plant. What are you doing? And he said, well, what the hell? You know, uh, my driver, we had a driver for him. He has a friend who owns a bar. He's a Democrat. And he's a Democrat. He just endorsed him. I said, would you, would you consider endorsing <laughs> Uh, our client, the Republican, he said, I can't do that, I can't do that, but I have him up for a photo op. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> so I, I, I gotta tell this, Sid. Um, we had him up. We took pictures, and I wrote the endorsement. So <laughs> Dick Hughes endorsed two candidates for the same office. Could I just say one more thing, if I may? Um, and it's to it's to tell you one more story about Dick Hughes. Uh, my mother was dying of cancer. She had never met Dick Hughes, and uh, he was then on the Supreme Court. I went into uh, I had worked from earlier. And I, I talked to Judy Zorowski, his secretary. I, I explained what was going on. <clears throat> and I said, my mother's passing just about out the door. Uh, would the governor consider writing a letter? So I, wrote this le I went in to see my mother a couple of days later. She was crying, I thought, <clears throat> from pain, but she was, so, she was so happy. There was this long letter talking about my father was a Jersey City fireman and all this stuff. And frankly, three days later, she died. Frankly, a happy woman, and I, and I thought about that because I think he would do that probably thousands and thousands of times. Writing these letters, Joel and I were together when he was with our firm, and he didn't bring in that many clients, God bless him, but he'd write these wonderful letters day after day, not considering about the, trying to generate business or uh, whatnot. And that story about the New York law firm is really, really, really something, but I, I thought about that because he, would, he was the kindest person I think I ever met. That was it. <coughs> I'm sorry that our mark, our, our mic is not with us, because there's a part of the story that he would have been at telling us, but that as someone who had just moved to this state, I kept hearing about this person named Betty Hughes, and every single speech I ever heard Governor Hughes talk about was about. Betty Hughes, and Betty Hughes was usually telling him that he had just done something incredibly stupid. <laughs> and, but Betty would somehow or another say something wise. And this brought him and his family into New Jersey's life for me. And I didn't know any of these people, except I also learned a lot about the, his cats. Because he would tell stories about going to the grocery store and shopping for the cats. Now, how did this all come into these speeches? I don't know. But somehow or another, this was a real person talking to me. And to everybody else in this homey, probably corny way. Uh, but Betty Hughes, I suspect, was just as much of a force as he would tell us about. And I suspect that all of you had some of that experience, which may be in your book, John. Well, there are lots of stories about Betty Hughes in the book, um, and she's certainly a dominant force. And she was a, uh, an interesting writer, and she loved. To talk, she would talk about anything and everything. I don't know if people know that she herself uh, did 500 shows on one of the local Philadelphia stations, and talked about everybody, interviewed everybody, um, and uh, it was just that way. She would talk about picking up the groceries and things like that. I have one story in the paper about how one day they had, at the last minute, decided to have a party for one of uh, their relatives. And the same day they were going in to hear Merv Griffin have the opening of one of his new shows. And so there in the morning in the supermarket with Dick Hughes, who was governor at the time, going in to purchase the stuff for the party later on. And of course they decided to do that, not remembering that the cook was on vacation, <laughs> and so they get back, and so in they go to the Merv Griffin show, back they come, the next day they have this big party. But she loved to tell stories. Does everybody know that she was a very large woman and spent a lot of time at the Duke? But she tells this wonderful story, uh, I hope it's a wonderful story and you'll enjoy it in the book, uh, about why she didn't worry about being fat. She said, you know, I was slim and trim when I married my first husband, and I was still pretty good when I married my second husband, and I had two wonderful husbands, and I had a lot of great children, and yeah, I was fat, but they reelected my husband knowing he had a fat wife, <laughs> and it didn't seem to bother anybody, and she said, uh, you know, I would go to Acapulco and swim in a size 52 bathing suit, and I'd go to a White House dinner in a... Uh, outfit made by Omar the tent maker. <laughs> never bothered me. And then she finally concluded that it was one day when she was on the show with Bess Meyerson. And she said Bess Meyerson was only a couple of 
he was younger than I was, and anybody watching the show would say, that's her daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and she decided maybe she would go to Duke, and she only lost 80 pounds, as a matter of fact, and then gained a lot of it back, and so on. But she was, uh, she had, she was a very opinionated uh, woman also. She had her opinion. And there's another story about how she uh, went out and uh, was describing uh, something. And she was more conservative than her husband, undoubtedly. And she's, well, she made a statement that he was upset about because it was inconsistent with something he was pushing. And she, he was trying to keep her from saying it. And she said, if he can support that commie Genovese <laughs> <laughs> for free speech, he can, he can support me. So she was, she was in herself a, a very interesting person. Some people know her better than I do. Uh, so. Okay, Joe, jo, why don't we uh, go and then, then we'll close and then just uh, after Joel finishes. First one I remembered immediately while Ray was talking about their beginning friendship and the Martinis. In the years when she was in the Duke, uh, 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 Zicky was invited to and I to come down for weekends. And we got on the plane, and we were going Friday, coming back Sunday night, I think. And as we got on the plane for uh, Duke, I don't remember, I'm getting a little losing states and cities over there. Right? So we got on the plane, and Dixie says, you know, we have to support Betty, and that means we eat at Dr. Somebody's place and we eat rice and we eat uh, food and stuff like that and I said Gee, that'll be great for me I need it badly but how do you do it every weekend he said oh yeah, I have a couple of martinis I don't care what <laughs> <laughs> Jet port in New Jersey at, in Reading. So <laughs> and, and uh, of course, everybody went wild where I live because right next to it. So I called the Dick Hughes up and I said, Hey, Governor, do you know that the North Runway goes right through my house? <laughs> and that, was, that was the end of the whole thing. <laughs> uh, that was when they had that slogan, Keep Goldberg out of Solberg. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to thank uh, John and our panel. I think some of them would be happy to talk to you.